Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, January 16th, 2023. Coming up on the show today, from Avatar, The Way of Water, editor Steve Rifkin. Jim said, look, here's the way I feel. There are times when you just want to experience the scene and not just jump story point to story point. Whenever you have a film that's running over three hours long, you have a responsibility to explore ways to cut it down, to keep the story moving. On that note, I just want to ask one thing of you, and that is that you consider maybe retiring the rough cut. Yes, all that and a lot more on this edition of The Rough Cut. Okay, are we ready? We're ready. I'm sure you're ready. We'll see if I'm ready. Only one way to find out. Welcome to The Rough Cut. So glad to have you here. Got a big movie to talk about today. I'm sure you knew this one was coming. I didn't have to tell you. By now, everyone on the planet has seen it, so I think we can safely talk about it without any fear that we'll spoil anything. Not that we spoil anything anyway. Not at all. The idea is that we make the movie even better because you get to meet the editors behind it and learn all about the hard work that went into making it. One such editor is Steve Rifkin, our guest today on the show. The last time that, I believe, I interviewed Steve was for the first Avatar back in 2010. I ask you, where does the time go? Well, I guess it goes into making movies, because it would be a decade before we got the sequel to the original Avatar. But based on the mild box office success, I guess it was worth the wait. Speaking of waiting, the last thing I want to do is to keep you waiting for this talk with Steve, especially since I hardly need to explain the concept of Avatar to set it up for you. So what I will do is jump right into the part where I give you some real good info about how you can make your next movie, maybe it's a sequel to a billion dollar hit, maybe it isn't. Either way, I'm going to introduce you to some people who can help you make sure that your next movie sounds amazing. And those amazing people would be the same folks who helped to bring you this podcast, which is so nice of them, right? They travel under the name Extreme Music. Well before even the first Avatar came out, they have been the ones that film and TV makers have turned to for the very best in production audio. That's an industry term for audio that you put into your production, specifically music. Even more specifically, music made by some of the biggest names in the world of film scoring and just overall music making. They have a seemingly endless catalog of tracks that you can easily search through using all the keywords one would associate with music. You know, tempo, lyrics, all that stuff. You can even upload a track to them. Maybe one you really like but could never afford to put in your movie. And Extreme Music will find you one that's as good, if not better. They make all the licensing stuff really easy. You do it right there on their website. Or you can talk to a real human being. Possibly an avatar, but they will seem real. So the next time you have a story to tell, make it sound great with production audio from Extreme Music. All right, we are off to Pandora, my friends. Time for a little talk with editor Steve Rivkin about cutting Avatar the way of water. When I talked about anything Pandora-related was back in 2010, when the first film was well on its way to breaking box office records. So I thought we'd try and sort of frame up Avatar 2 and possibly 3 with when you actually started working on Way of Water. And over that time, if you can quantify it, what were the big phases of the film? Well, I think I came on this film in 2017. I was brought on very early to work on story reels and art reels. And the production design department had generated literally thousands of drawings and paintings and models and you know i mean they they were designing all the characters the environments all of the props and hardware plant life sea life you name it i mean people don't realize the amount of pre-production and design that would go into a film like this and john and jim wanted to start putting together art reels to get the studio excited about the projects at the same time we had always talked about doing some kind of a story reel where we could kind of map out the beats of the film using art or whatever was available at the time. And I think we eventually ended up with a cast reading that any piece of art that worked for a section, I would use it. And if I didn't have something, I'd put a title card in or something. But just to kind of get a sense of the flow of the story. And of course, We never really had the time to go all the way through Avatar 2 and 3 with that. And I got quite a bit of Avatar 2 mapped out, but we had to pull the trigger on starting capture, which happened, I want to say, 
2018 or something is when that began. I don't even know. It's all kind of a fog right now <laughs> when you look back at it. Hearing you describe the story reel process made me wonder if you'd ever done an animated feature before. I should know this, but I, I got to admit I don't. Have you done animation before and how might this compare to something like that? Well, I have not done an animated feature. I'm very familiar with the process, knowing a number of my assistants have gone on to do animation, and I've done a lot of research into their process, and I'm very familiar with it. The storyboarding process and shot design has some similarity to a project like this in the sense that we kind of map things out much differently. We map it out with a performance edit for the whole film, and then eventually we go into virtual production and shots are created. And a couple of similarities to an animated project in the sense that if you need a shot, you can create one. It's not like you're limited to what is photographed in a normal movie, but that's getting a little ahead of the process. You know, I mean, I think it's important to understand. Well, before we move on to that, let me say the similarities are that it takes a very long time to make an Avatar film. And probably in the realm of an animated film, anywhere from three to five years or whatever it is. And there are similarities in the sense that you kind of map out the film before you shoot it in virtual form. So there are similarities like that. You weren't just making one movie, but in a sense, two. In terms of Way of Water and then Avatar 3, whatever it's going to be called. Are you working truly independently or were there things that you did for Avatar 3 that you were working on before Way of Water was even finished? How do those two movies for you as an editor balance out? Are they really independent? Or are you like today, Steve, you're working on this scene from Way of Water and then tomorrow you might be working on elements of the next film? Well, first of all, I'm representing our editorial team of four editors. That would be myself, John Lafua, who was along for the ride on Avatar 1 with Jim as the third editor. And we also hired David Brenner, who we tragically lost last February. Mm. He was a very integral part of our team, and we miss him terribly. I'm heartbroken that he wasn't able to see the film finished and all the hard work that he and all of us put into it. And then to be able to see this wonderful reception that it's getting, it's really sad. And uh, I just wanted to give a little shout out to him, his friendship, his dedication to editing, his love of his work and his masterful skills. So how we ended up working on two and three, a lot of it was dictated by the logistics of having to shoot out certain sections of the film. Obviously, all of the performance capture was done in one big block over a couple of years. And then when it came down to it, there was a necessity to work on scenes that involved live action, because live action sets were being built in much in the same way you would work on a normal film where you'd have to shoot out a set. If a set appeared in both films, well, it didn't make sense to tear it down and rebuild it again later, so you'd shoot that out. That's the live action part of it. But we also had an enormous number of scenes that involved a principal live action character being the spider character in the film. And we had to prepare all the scenes that we would shoot with him to be ready for live action so that that could be shot out because he was a live action element in a CG virtual world. So what we would do is he acted out the film as a capture, all of the scenes that would eventually be done with him as a live action figure. So he would essentially do the film twice. Let me digress a second. Sure. In our process, we cut the film a minimum of two times. So in the capture process, the actors are on a, a stage, which we call a volume, and they're all of the captured cameras, and I almost hesitate to call them cameras because they don't create shots. Let's call them recorders on the ceilings that track all the movements of every actor on the volume. And there's a facial camera that records their audio, but also uh, records every nuance of their face movement. 
and their facial performance. So we have reference cameras of this because you can't edit that data. So there are about 16 reference cameras, and that means people standing around with high-definition cameras, everyone assigned to a character, shooting a big close-up of whoever they're assigned to, and a couple of them get wide shots. So you have a, an idea of what their body motion is and how they relate to each other. And then we take those reference cameras and we put together a performance edit that represents the best takes of every actor. And we're not limited to like two actors in a scene, take five is the best. We're not limited to that because maybe one actor is better in take two and one's better in take six. We can actually combine them together in a shootable file. That's the basics. There are also complications where we can stitch performances together, like the first half from one take, the second half from another of the same actor, and so forth. So there are a lot of little tricks that we have to build these scene files to be shot later. So what happens is we carefully review the dailies of the reference with Jim, and we take copious notes about the best take here for this, for that, just like you would do in a normal movie. Only now we're constructing these scene files, we call them loads, where everything is prepared to be shot virtually. So what we do is we turn it over to our internal lab, and they process all of the characters as they're designed, they bring in the environments that have been designed and the props and the wardrobe and you name it, the whole thing. And then it becomes a shootable virtual scene. And all of the best performances are included in this. So by the time Jim is picking up the virtual camera, months, sometimes years later, the actors are no longer there. It's just a playback of all the best performances cobbled together in a file that is always perfect. So nobody misses their mark or blows a line or whatever. So now in the first stage, Jim can focus on the pure performance and interact with the actors to get what he wants for the scene. And in this second phase, with no actors present, now he doesn't worry about dealing with the performances. He knows he's got the best ones. Now it's all about shot creation. So with the virtual camera, we're now creating the shots that we will edit a second time to make up the scenes that are ultimately turned over and finished in, a, in an edited form. So that said, getting back to the Spider character, Jack Champion, who plays Spider, acted out his entire role for the movie in virtual form. So in other words, he was captured along with the other actors and he was quite a bit younger. His voice was higher. <laughs> it was because I, I, I think it was, I think it was maybe four years, three or four years later where we're shooting him in live action where he was quite a bit taller and his voice had changed, but that was anticipated. Maybe not to the extent that it changed, but it was anticipated. And we dealt with the scale issues for the virtual character to compensate for the fact that he would be a little bit larger by the time we shot him. So the entire film was done with him as a CG character. And then that became essentially the blueprint of how we would photograph him in real life to take the place of his virtual character. So we had to do this. We had to do it over the two films because, you know, he's growing and changing. He's the only character that's growing and changing. And we had to shoot out his live action. Now, virtual characters doesn't matter. They can put on a capture suit. They could age. They could have a haircut. They could gain or lose weight. They can always play the character in virtual form and be unchained. So no matter what they look like in real life, it doesn't matter. There's no time restriction on that. But Jack, he was like the driving force of the order of things that had to be shot, as well as 
the live action blocks where we were shooting in New Zealand. Well, you just gave me a lot to follow up on. I mean, I was already thinking back to your points about the story reel process and where you're also involved in crafting the story and what will be shot and what will be produced. Again, looking at this as two films, if you're doing just a single film and you're working on a scene and you're just trying to nail that scene, you get it perfect. It still might have ramifications elsewhere in the film. Is it even bigger here where you're working on something in Avatar 2 that is going to have an impact on 3 that you have to actually keep in your head, keep in mind, how is this story working across two separate pictures? Well, Jim wanted all the editors to read all the scripts, not just two and three, but four and five as well. So we understood the entire saga arc, but particularly two and three, because that's what we're concentrating on now. He liked to refer to it as one big film with a slice in the middle, you know, so you have to be cognizant of what you do in two effects three, because the story has ramifications downstream. Any cut you make, you have to make those considerations. And there have been times when we cut things that Jim said, I'm going to put this in movie three. So we're always aware, we have to be aware of at least these two together at this moment in time. Was there rhyme or reason to how the work was distributed amongst the four of you? Well, primarily it's the three of us. Jim is obviously doing other things and he enters the editorial process at a later stage on every scene. But we would prepare the performance edits and that's a job that is impossible to describe the complexity of it, building picture in picture of different performances and trying to demonstrate what would be a scene, but it's not a scene. You know, I don't even know. It's one of the hardest things for all of our editors to wrap their brain around. John and I had a steep learning curve on Avatar 1. David came into the scene on this one and Jim said to him, You know, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure this thing out and how you cut a performance at it. And you're probably not going to be much help for months, maybe six months, because the learning curve is so steep. And David picked it up so quickly, I think he astounded all of us. And it's a testament to how smart he was and how skilled and dedicated he was. But he, he, he was a natural. And so... I think Jim was surprised at the speed that he picked this up. And of course, he had great teachers, you know, so. Of course, come on. (laughs) But anyway, we were a great team together and we helped each other when we'd have questions. How the hell do you do this? And how do we, you know, I mean, you have to picture this concept of. I kind of use the analogy at times where every character is a as an overdub track. So if you're looking at stacks of of characters, if you're using them from different takes, we had native takes, which we call as shots, where it's as it was shot, the two characters, and I'm using a two character scene, but we had character scenes with, with eight, 10, 15 characters, and imagine the complexity of that. But let's take a simple two character scene. So you have to account for each character And if there's a different body track, you have to account for that in a similar timing. And the face tracks are separate because many times lines get moved slightly or changed slightly. And we have the ability to actually put a different line on the same character. We have a, you know how there's, in a normal movie, there's ADR. We do something called FPR, which was, which was, facial performance replacement. So what happens here is that instead of going into an ADR session, the actor would come in and reread their lines. So you're not just getting, you're not limited to the sync of the original performance. Now, sometimes we do it for the technical reasons that everybody will do ADR for. And other times there'd be a slight line change or a delivery change that Jim wanted. And you're not only recording the new audio for it, but you're getting a complete facial performance of that. And then we would plant that on their body and be able to change a line and combine it for the final shot. So 
if there's a scene that cut out, got, got, got cut out, and we need to insert a line into another scene that existed in a scene that got cut, Jim has the capability of doing that as FPR and putting it somewhere else. Now, that's a tool that a lot of editors would like to have, I'm sure. Yeah, I would think. You know, I have this question later on. I think I need to address it now. I'll probably mess myself up later on by doing it now, but I think I have to. Hearing you talk about all these different iterations and all these different elements and things like FPR, editors have their process for how they stack their timeline and how they do the things, you know, turnovers to VFX and how they keep track of all the different elements that they have to manage over time. How do you do that here? Is it sort of similar where like my timeline just gets bigger in terms of tracks? I can always go back to older elements, do multi-cam stuff where I can see the mocap and other things at the same time. How do you manage all these different assets over the course of this project? Well, we thank Avid for increasing the track capabilities <laughs> because- You're welcome. We use them. I'll, I'll say on Avatar 1, we were putting the reference material underneath the virtual cameras so that everything was underneath. We could step down and see the performances that were used to create the virtual cameras in every shot. With this film, because of the number of characters and the number of tracks needed and the complexity of the things we were doing, we said, how are we going to do this? So we had a couple of brainstorming sessions and decided, well, let's just use the tracks above instead of below. Because you want your picture track that you play at to not be, you know, 40 tracks above your audio tracks. So we, we kept it close. And as we would build scenes to turn over, our dedicated assistant crew would go through and recreate all of the reference above the play track. So you might have a, a 15 character scene and everybody's accounted for in the sync that they exist from their various takes above the play track. And that way we could remain consistent. So you might have one scene with 15 characters and one scene with two. Well, that would make a, that have on the, Two character scenes have an unnecessary gap between the play of the play track and the audio track. So we decided that this would give us the flexibility. So we're using all the all the tracks above the play track, and we're building the reference track. All everything had to be accounted for so that EDLs could be generated to go to Weta, so that every single face and body had had its own track. How is that different for you as an editor when you're working with a director who is also familiar with the Avid and log time in the chair? Well, I think one of the things to point out is that with his incredible knowledge of editing, a lot of times when he picks up the virtual camera, he will shoot with certain things in mind. Now, this is beyond the capture process, obviously, because capture is just performance only. But in the virtual photography stage where he's creating shots to use to cut, he has a very good idea of what he would like to try. And then he usually will shoot off into several different directions where he'll try an alternative uh, pattern. And one of the wonderful things about this process is that the editors are involved in the virtual camera process. We're either present with him or we're on, on Zoom and because of the pandemic, we were remoting into the Avids in New Zealand when he was doing his virtual photography there. Obviously, when he was in L.A., it was different. So I think for the, the first period of the pandemic, we rotated in and out of New Zealand. So there was at least one editor there most of the time. And then the whole last year, we were remoting in and he was shooting his virtual cameras. But my point was that in our process, the editor is there putting together the scenes as he's shooting them and interacting with him and basically working together to shape the direction that the scene goes. And he may say, I see this little assembly of this section of the, of the scene. Maybe I'll shoot a wide shot to go here and maybe I don't need this shot or maybe I should shoot another shot to bridge these. And so you're 
constantly showing him things and he is reacting to it. And you're influencing creatively the process of shooting, which seldom happens in filmmaking. So it's a unique relationship that we have during that virtual camera process. You know, one of the things that Jim Cameron has talked about is waiting on the technology needed to realize his vision for Avatar 2, certainly the underwater motion capture stuff. Knowing how much he likes to lean forward into new technology, a film like this, as you said, it's going to take a while to put together. And over the course of that timeline, no pun intended, there are new advancements in technology. Were there times where you had to stop and go, wait, there's some new things that we need to add to our bag of tricks? Or was it literally from day one? No, this is what we have here today is what we're going to be utilizing from here on throughout. Well, I, I think that it's funny. Both are true. There were techniques that were used in capture. Then you talked about the underwater capture. I mean, that was, I think, unprecedented. And that presented its own set of challenges editorially to get good reference on underwater swimmers, good faces on the actors underwater. And it helped that they weren't speaking underwater, obviously. But uh, the communication to the actors from the director was a challenge, and they figured out ways to do that. The above water stuff, a lot of times needed. ADR or FDR because of the noise of the equipment and the, they had balls floating in the water to soften the light underneath the water. It was all new technology. It was all things that had never been done. I mean, Jim's an explorer, a scientist, a visionary, and everything has to be based in reality and has to be accurate in terms of the physics of everything. I mean, they actually experimented in the beginning with hanging actors on wires like a lot of films have done for dry for wet. And he said, no way, there's just too much of this that has to be real. And they built these enormous tanks. It was like, I don't know, a million gallon tank or something. And it was quite a feat. But there were times when, if you're asking in editing, if there were times when we would stop and and is that what you're asking about the technological changes or yeah all the above i think anything's fair game here because again people are hesitant to make changes certainly in hollywood when you've got something that's working and as much as you might want to try something new there's always that like mm, yeah but uh, we, what we got is let's if it's not broke i think there's a little bit of that you know obviously the media composer had advances in software upgrades and new features and things like that when you're working on something for years at a time, there are going to be changes. So we would try to keep up with as much as we could. You know, I mean, storage is, is storage. We're, we're kind of stuck with the terabytes and terabytes that we have of storage. We, we can't really be upgrading storage except possibly between movies. But then you want to be able to access the material that you have because the motion library is valuable to all the films. So I think if anything is limited, it's upgrades to storage because it's just a massive job to change that. So when I saw the film, I saw it in 3D high frame rate, which I can't imagine seeing it any other way. I mean, I think if you don't, you're losing a lot of the hard work that you guys put into this. But just those two elements, 3D and high frame rate, it seems like when I ask editors especially lately about the 3D component of a film that they've done. Usually it's like, well, I had nothing to do with that. That took place downstream for me. For you guys, were you actually working in stereoscopic? How integrated into the 3D process were you? Well, I, I hate to be among the editors that say we didn't have much to do with it, but the reality is we had a whole department that dealt with the 3D and all of the interoculars of it all and all the technical aspects of the depth and they would concentrate on that. And that would be like the final phase before it gets turned over to Weta would be perfecting the 3D to go there. And so what they would do is we would prepare a scene for turnover and Jim would sign off on it and it would be their responsibility to check it. And so we don't cut in 3D. It's something that gets checked afterwards. And if something's an issue, we address it. Are there things you need to stay away from, cuts you need to stay away from, because they may not work as well in the 3D treatment? Well, I think we found out in Avatar 1 that a lot of times in action sequences, very fast cuts 
if the 3D is extreme, and they can control the amount of 3D that you see. So there were a couple sequences in Avatar 1 where the 3D was reduced, where there was, I think, the Thanator chase was one where it was just too jarring to see these quick cuts with an extreme amount of 3D. So we backed off on it. And sometimes we even came very close to 2D on some shots. It all has to be looked at and analyzed. And we have people that look at it that have been involved with this company and this production since Avatar 1 and have become very, very educated as to what Jim's standards are for 3D. Now, in terms of cutting, we know that certain things lend themselves to 3D, hanging in shots longer, having foreground and background relationships. Jim is big on drifting cameras to show depth in 3D. And there's there are very few shots in the film that don't move or the camera doesn't move to emphasize the depth and the 3D. As far as the high frame rate, that was something, again, that Jim made a decision that he wanted all the underwater shots to be exhibited at high frame rate and action shots where normally you'd have quick pans and there'd be strobing, which was, I think, something that made it uncomfortable on Avatar 1 and many 3D films when there, there are pans and your traditional strobing that would happen on a pan is exacerbated in 3D where it can actually create some form of fatigue. So he wanted to address that in this movie, and that was how he did it. But again, in the editorial process, it was not something that was a factor. We were just editing the film, and a lot of times Jim would say, well, this is going to be a, a 48 shot, or this has to be a 48 shot because the amount of struggling. And so he would cherry pick certain things, and then he had rules about all the underwater sequences, obviously any, any, any quick pan movement. And again, it was more something that was out of our realm. And we had departments that dealt with this stuff. You know, we were editing the movies. One of the things you have to consider as a filmmaker, as a storyteller is certainly in a sequel is how much re-education do I need to do for the audience? You know, Avatar 1 was over a decade ago. And so you have to make these decisions about, all right, how much time do I spend at the beginning getting them caught up? And how do I do that? Well, I think the philosophy was that it had to stand on its own. And maybe if you if you didn't see Avatar 1, it could pique your curiosity to go back and take a look at it. But I think the film stands on its own. There may be some people that didn't really understand the Avatar program itself with humans stepping into a link and becoming an Avatar. And there still were characters like Norm and some of the other Avatar programs at High Camp when we first meet them. and. I think for someone who isn't familiar with Avatar 1, a little confusing, like, how does this exist? They're in human form, they're in Avatar form. But I think for the most part, it does stand on its own. And I think, Jake, the narration of picking up where you left off and the family growing and settling, I mean, you, I think it's pretty clear. Amongst all the jaw-dropping visuals in the film, that middle section spent underwater that could have been a whole other movie unto itself. It was just so immersive. I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but for you as an editor, is it a constant battle of look at all we went through to create this shot and you just want to savor every literally frame of it versus I got to keep the story moving and keep the narrative progressing? You know, it's funny you mentioned that because obviously whenever you have a film that's running over three hours long as editors, you have a responsibility to explore ways to cut it down, to keep the story moving. And I really credit Jim for defending the experience of being immersed in a film like this. There are times when you just normally you'd, you'd say cut and move on. And Jim said, look, here's the way I feel. There are times when you just want to experience the scene and not just jump story point to story point. And it's in a class by itself, I think. He uses the argument that on Avatar 1, the studio kept saying, cut down the flying sequence, it's indulgent, 
It's not necessary to be there that long. And it happened to end up being one of the most talked about and loved sections of the film. And so he always pointed to that and said, people are going to want to just experience this underwater 3D immersive cinematic experience. And I just want to let them feel that. I want them to be there. You talked about returning to Pandora. One of the things, the opening images of the film were these iconic shots of the floating mountains and the forest of Pandora. And it just took you back in two or three shots. You're like, okay, I remember this, which was, I think, a great move on Jim's part to do that so that people got sucked back in in the first 20 seconds, you know, to this world that they hadn't seen in many years. Well, I mean, the film is so big in so many different ways. We could literally talk for days about this film, but I'm not going to put you through that. The good news is that as we've discussed, there's another one coming at some point, so we can get back together then, (laughs) perhaps do a sequel to this interview. The only thing I have left to ask you, because I've kind of run out of questions, is what do you miss most about being the president of ACE? Is it the adulation, meeting with world leaders, the motorcades? What is it, Steve? (laughs) I'm still very much involved with ACE, and I love the organization. I don't miss being president. It was uh, something that was an honor to serve for the two terms that I did. And we have wonderful, wonderful people on the board and the leadership, and I think it's in good hands. I still remain on the board. I think our commitment to advancing the perception of editing continues. And on that note, I just want to ask one thing of you, and that is that you consider maybe retiring the rough cut name, because I think that's an antiquated term. And and, and Avid has actually enabled editors to present anything but something that looks rough. And I'd suggest possibly first cut, which many editors are happy to use that term over rough cut, because nothing we do is rough anymore. How about that? Well, first of all, I'd have to remake the hats. Um, No, I don't have any hats. Well, the rough cut is really more about me and the fact that I never finish anything properly. So it was my excuse for why there's always going to be mistakes in what I do. But I I hear you. Let me give it some thought. Yeah, give it some thought. And I want to give a a final shout out to an amazing crew, not only our editors and the memory of David Brenner, but we had two additional editors, Jason Gaudio, who was with me as a first on Avatar 1, is now doing additional editing. Also, Ian Silverstein, those two, and a wonderful army of assistants that made this film, enabled us to get it to this point and on the screen and out into the world. And they are truly amazing. Many thanks to them and our visual effects editors and assistants. I think we had probably 20 plus assistants and uh, half a dozen, four or five in New Zealand as well. And it was quite a feat. I don't think there's a more difficult process to make a movie than what we've done here. And it took a village to make it happen. No question. And that village made an amazing movie. I can't wait to see the next one. And thank you, Steve, for uh, taking a little break and talking to us about Avatar Way of Water. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Changing the name of the rough cut? I don't know. What do you think, boys and girls? It has crossed my mind. And I will be the first to say that using the word cut as a play on words to discuss anything to do with editing is well beyond played out. I hate that I contribute to that. But I've had that rough cut tag since 2005. I don't think you can teach this old dog any new tricks on that front. No matter what we call this podcast, it would be nothing without editors like Steve Rifkin to share all his Hollywood editing magic with us. Ooh, I could call it the Hollywood Editing Magic Podcast. Yes, it's a bit much, but then again, so am I. Anyway, thank you, Steve Rifkin, for talking with us today about Avatar, The Way of Water. You and your team did something really incredible together, and now you get to catch your breath and bask in a little glory. You know what else would be absolutely glorious? If you were to check out what's new with Avid Media Composer. So get on over to Avid.com and see all the latest and greatest with the nonlinear editor behind all the Avatar movies. All right, my friend, we are done for today. I hope you had fun. Next week, we'll have even more fun. Trust me. Until then, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut.